Isn't, isn't it great to know that? His eye is on the sparrow, right? Just a little bird. He watches over the little birds that we see when we go out. And the Bible says that His eye is on us, His children. He watches over us. Thank You, Lord. Father, we thank You this morning. Our Lord, for Your ceaseless, constant care of us. Father, we ask You to forgive us, for we oftentimes despair. We ask You to forgive us, Lord, for we are weak and we have little faith. But Father, we pray that we may be strengthened to know You more. Father, to see what a great God we serve. Father, we pray that the vision of who You are will grow before our eyes. Even so, today again, as we open up Your Word, Father, we pray that You may speak to us through it. We pray that we, we may be doers of this Word, that You will give us an obedient heart. And Father, I ask You to forgive me my sins. Thank You, Lord, for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. <clears throat> Let's open our Bibles. <clears throat> we want to bring this morning the second part, um, the second part of this message that we began last Sunday based on Ephesians 4, verse 32. In Ephesians 4, verse 32, the second part of this verse reads like this. Ephesians 4, verse 32b. The second part of the verse says, Forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We have been talking about forgiveness as we are closing chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians. Pretty soon we'll move into chapter 5 of Ephesians. But there is more that we want to say on the topic of forgiveness. Last Sunday, we defined what forgiveness is. Last Sunday, we looked at the, the words that stand out in the original language that are used for forgiveness. How many of you remember those definitions? I'm sure that you by now have memorized it. <laughs> I have great faith, right? <laughs> but if you remember uh, correctly, we said that forgiveness means to let go of to send forth, to remit, to cancel a debt, to free from guilt and punishment. And that's one of the words used in the New Testament. We also said that there is another word for forgiveness, which is the one being used in this passage, that means to give freely, unconditionally, gratuitously. If we combine those two uh, definitions or me sets of meanings together, we could say that to forgive somebody is to grant, to give unconditionally to someone a cancellation of his debts and offenses and freedom from their guilt and punishment incurred under justice. And this is precisely what God has done with us. Oh, that we could understand our forgiveness. The nature, the death of the forgiveness that we have received. All our debts have been canceled. All our offenses before a holy God have been set aside, have been sent away. Or our guilt and our liability to punishment before a holy God have been canceled. That obligation had been, has been dismissed. Because of Christ Jesus, who took it upon Himself to take care of such obligations for us. That is the Savior that we have. That is the nature of the One that has redeemed us. He has paid to the justice of God for us sinners. And we said last Sunday that our debt was immense, was great. 
We are, make no mistake about it, we are great sinners. There is no one that comes to salvation that does not come understanding this reality and this fact. I want to submit to you that if some claim to be in the gospel and in salvation, but they do not understand the death of their sinfulness and dead before a holy God, if somebody has come or claims to have come to God and to salvation who has not come through an understanding that we were great debtors before a holy God, that person has not truly understood God's forgiveness. And we may have reason to question whether that person is forgiven at all. Those that are forgiven are those that acknowledge their great debt. And we have come and acknowledged our great debt before God. I, I always remember John Newton's, uh, one of his, the phrases that he was fond of saying as he grew older, John Newton, the one that wrote um, Amazing Grace, and uh, he used to say, I know two things. I know that I am a great sinner, but I also know that I have a great Savior. And that is the basis upon which the Apostle Paul calls us to forgive. As he says in Ephesians 4.32b, forgiving one another, and you may ask why. Well, even as God in Christ forgave you. Why are we called to forgive? We said last Sunday, because we have been forgiven. Because we have been gifted with the grace of forgiveness. Lest you ask yourself, unless there be questions in your mind whether you are forgiving others, we have brought this message and we begin with this quote by Thomas Watson. He was a Puritan from the 17th century. I want to submit to you that if you want to find good reading, very good edifying books, that you begin to consult the dead. No, don't, don't, I'm not talking about going to those that bring up the spirits and all that. I'm talking about reading old books. I'm talking about going back to reading books from the 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th century. Get a hold of some of those good Puritan classics. And you're going to see in a, spirit, a spirituality that is unmatched like what we see today in our bookstores. Listen to what this man wrote in Body of Divinity, page 581. He asked the question, it's at the top of your outline. It says, when do we forgive others? When do we forgive others? And he says, when we strive against all thoughts of revenge. When we will not do our enemies mischief, but wish well to them, grieve at their calamities, pray for them, seek reconciliation with them, and show ourselves ready on all occasions to relieve them. Ah, that's just a mouthful, isn't it? That's a full plate in one paragraph. And the reason I... I want to take it back to the Puritans is because their books are full of things like this. In every paragraph, they're full of nuggets of truth that are loaded with things like that. When, when am I in the process of forgiving somebody? When, how do I know that I've forgiven someone? When I strive against all thoughts of revenge, when we will, knew, when we will not do them harm, but wish well to them, grieve at their calamities, pray for them, seek reconciliation with them, and show ourselves ready in all occasions to help them, to relieve them. We have entitled this message from the Christian's Wardrobe Series, Forgiveness, Am I Really Putting This Dress On? Last Sunday we say, this is a dress we must put on. This Sunday we're saying and asking, am I putting this dress on? We'll look at it. It's there in the wardrobe. It's in the Christian's wardrobe. It belongs to us. The question is now, am I putting it on? As believers, we claim to forgive others, but have I really forgiven my offender? How can I know? What does forgiveness look like in practice? These are some of the questions that we, we want to try to answer and help you answer 
And as we launch some small groups next uh, year, we're going to have outlines like this that we want you to take to your small groups and deal with them and revisit them and go through some of the questions and, and work with them in your small groups um, when, you, when you come together. What's the main idea of this passage, of this sermon? Christians ought to make sure they know what forgiveness is about in order to truly forgive our offenders. If we don't know what forgiveness is about, we may fall short of truly forgiving someone. The first thing I want to tell you this morning is that forgiving does not invalidate anger. How many of you have felt angry? Yes. Forgiving does not invalidate anger. As a matter of fact, anger is a legitimate and natural response to being offended. If you do not ever get angry, I wonder if you're alive. There's something wrong with somebody that never gets angry. Because getting angry is part of life. Getting angry is a natural response to being offended. Now, listen, it is not suppressing anger that allows one to forgive. I'm angry. I shouldn't be this way. I shouldn't be angry. I shouldn't be angry with this person. I shouldn't be angry. And there you are, obsessed with being angry, but that's not the way about going. That's not how you go about forgiving somebody. You're angry. Acknowledge it. I'm angry. Okay? I'm angry. It is not suppressing anger that allows one to forgive, but what we do with it. What do you do with your anger? This is where God calls us now to pay attention, okay? We're going to get angry, but what are you going to do with your anger? Forgiving says, I am angry. But then he goes on to say, but I must still do right regardless. Folks, we must do right even when we are angry. And forgiving is part of doing right. God calls us to obey Him. God calls us to honor Him. God calls us to forgive. Yes, we get angry. Let's acknowledge our anger, but what are we doing with that anger? Well, there was a time in my life that I punched a hole in the wall of my bathroom. Pastor, you did that? Yes, I did. I got very angry. And I punched a wall. Thank God it was not like walls in Cuba. It was one of these stucco, you know, flimsy. I said, wow, I'm real strong. <laughs> no, it's a flimsy wall. <laughs> Don't go punching marble or, or something like that. You're going to mess up your hands. There, there, there's a time in our lives that we... It, with our anger, have done much wrong. But as we grow and mature, God is calling us to do right even when we get angry. Let me show you what the Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 26. Notice what Paul says there in Ephesians 4, verse 26. Be angry. Oh, commandment to be angry. No, it's not a commandment to be angry. It's permission to be angry. To be angry. Because we're humans. Because anger is part of our natural way of responding to a world that has fallen. Okay? Be angry, but do not sin. So notice it's not about being angry. It's about what we're going to do with the anger. Be angry, but do not sin. What are we going to do with anger? We're called to not sin when we get angry. So that says that anger in itself is not sinful. Anger in itself is not sinful. Like sadness is not sinful. How many of you feel guilty because you're sad? I shouldn't be sad. I shouldn't be sad. You're sad. It's just a feeling. It's just an emotion. Emotions do not, emotions are not right or wrong, folks. Emotions are just that. They're, they're responses to the environment. The natural responses to the environment. It's what is happening in our hearts and in our minds. It's the attitudes of the heart and the mind that turn that into a sinful attitude or action or not. So here we have a laid out in Ephesians 4.26. 
be angry and do not sin. And then do not let the sun go down on your wrath, on your anger. Ah. Oh. Anger sustained and held on to is an indication of a sinful heart. See? We get angry and it's not sinful. But if we hold on to the anger, if we hold on to our wrath, and, and this is saying, please, be quick to deal with your anger. Do not let anger fester in you. Do not let anger take a grip of your heart. Because if you do so, what it means is, is that something is happening in your mind and in your heart that is for sure sinful. If you let that anger take a hold of you and grip you, you have succumbed to sinful attitudes. And, and it will definitely manifest in sinful actions of wrath and of anger. Be angry and do not sin. Forgiven says, yes, I am angry, but I must still do right. Notice what it says in Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 21. What are we going to do? How are we going to do right even when we're angry? Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Usually what we do with our anger is something wrong, is something sinful, and is something destructive. Think for a moment of the consequences of your anger. Think for a moment where your anger has led you. Think for a moment you thought that anger would lead you to a good place. You held on to that anger because it was a way of coping with the hurt and the offense. And you said, it is through this anger that I'm going to overcome. This anger is going to help me put away the offender, fight the enemy, fight those that are trying to hurt me. And then in your anger, you have plotted in your anger you have nursed the wound in your anger. You have put together plans to, re to retaliate. And now think for a moment what came out of those actions. <clears throat> we can be angry, but we don't have to do wrong. We can immediately address that anger when we look at what we're called to do. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil. Satan knows that if you give vent to your anger, he's got you in his grip. Satan knows that if you let the anger run its course and fester in your heart, and you let that anger soak your mind and your heart, Satan knows that he's got you in his grip, and it won't be long before destructive attitudes and actions begin to manifest themselves, hurting you, and hurting those around you. 1 Thessalonians 5. Notice what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 15. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 15 says, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. This is what God commands us. What we ought to do with our anger. I've begun to practice this even though I keep failing. Okay? But we must practice this. We must understand that if we do not overcome that evil and that offense that's been given to us with good, evil is going to overcome us. You know that Satan can't touch us? Satan can touch believers. Except if we give him an opening. And, and Satan loves nothing more than an angry Christian that holds on to his anger. If you go back to Ephesians, there in Ephesians 4, notice what follows verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. Satan is counting the minutes. 
He's there when He sets you off and He uses circumstances to do so. And you know what? We're not in control of circumstances. There's a lot of people that are going to come and trigger our buttons and set our, our buttons off and we're going to get angry. And when you're a believer, even more. Especially if you have had a history of a problem with anger. Satan knows where it, where it gets you. He's going to try and attack you right there in your weakest spot. And is there accounting the time when that anger sets in and he wants you to hold on to it? When that sun sets, says yes. Another day goes by. And the more and the more that anger sells in your heart, the more you have now opened yourself up for the enemy in your life. The enemy now comes and finds a way into your life. We said that Satan cannot possess us. Now, we said that Satan does ride dresses that we put on that shouldn't be on us. Imagine that you were to put on a, a, a suit or a dress, and when you were to put your hands into your pocket, you would find there, you know, debris and bugs and dirt, right? They don't come, right? They're, they're not part of you, but they were somehow sneaked into your dress, into your pockets, and Satan is wanting to do that. He wants to sneak into the pockets, the holes of your life, the dresses that don't belong with you. That's why in Sundays past we've been talking about dressing on with Christ and putting off the old man that is viced according to the deceitful desire of the flesh. When we hold on to those old dresses in those pockets, they're demons there is the attack of the enemy upon our lives, and we make no mistake about it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not that wife. It's not that husband that's making life difficult. It's not that boss. It's not that person. It's the enemy. It's Satan and his demons that want to destroy you. The Bible says that he came to steal, to rob, and to destroy. And we open our lives to him our dresses, when we disobey the Word of God. That's why the Bible says, resist Him and He will flee from you. He will flee from you. The moment we begin to say, Lord, help me. I need You, Lord. Father, help me through Your Word. Sanctify me in Your Word. Set me aside. Father, I want to put on the dress of Christ. I want to put on Christ's likeness in my life. Satan must flee. He finds no place, nor give place to the devil. What does that mean? That he's got to find an, an opening to get in. And, and, and the Apostle Paul says, don't give him a place. Don't give him an opening. And anger is one of those places that he oftentimes finds wide open in our lives. Folks, number two, forgiving others may not be what's necessary. Why? Why? Because you may be angry for the wrong reasons. <laughs> we're, we're, we're often finding somebody to blame for the way we are, we feel, right? And you, and you need to be mindful of that. There are frustrations in my life. There are issues in my life that I haven't dealt with. And oftentimes, I'm displacing it onto somebody else, and it's not their fault. It's your issue. It's your heart that needs to be addressed. It's the offenses you apparently have received. They are perceived offenses. They're not real. You need to be mindful of that. You can't just be... If you're somebody that... If you're somebody... Listen, how do I know that that's the case? Look at the pattern in your life. If you're somebody that is always picking up offenses... Chances are that some of those offenses are perceived. They're not real. It's your mind playing tricks on you. It's, it's your own heart leading you to be offended. It's your own issues that haven't been resolved. So oftentimes forgiving others may not be what's necessary because you may be angry for the wrong reasons. So you must discern whether I'm angry for sinful reasons. Am I angry for the right reasons 
or am I angry just for my sin? It is not the initial response of anger that is sinful, like we have already said, but the attitudes in the heart that are fueling it. The attitudes in the heart that are fueling is such as pride, selfishness, covetousness, lust, partiality, or simply ignorance. Pride. How many of us, when our pride is wounded, we are quick to what? To pick up an offense. He offended me. He looked at me the wrong way. He didn't greet me. He said this to me. It's your pride, folks. That's your pride that needs to be deflated. That's your ego that needs to come down. If you're picking up offenses every single day and quickly, think whether you have a prideful heart. Because that's why your heart is getting offended every day and so often. And we all, prideful heart is a basic package, by the way. It's a basic package. We all come with it. We all come with a prideful heart into this world because of our inherent sinfulness. And then it is the Holy Spirit of God that begins to break us and humble us so that we won't be so quick to pick up offenses left and right. Selfishness. That should have been me. Should have had that. That person didn't do anything to offend you. Yeah, because he got the job of the promotion. Now you're angry with that person. That's your selfishness. My brother got that. My sister did this, or so and such in the family is always getting everything, and I don't get it. That's just your selfishness. You don't have to be angry with that family member. No, don't be angry. You should be asking God to forgive you for your sinful heart. Lust, partiality, right? And sometimes plain ignorance. If we don't know the Word of God, and we don't know what is sin and what is not, and if we don't know the wisdom of God, oftentimes we're going to be angry either with God or angry with others. And it is just because we don't know. Because we don't know better. And we need to be taught. How many times we're angry with God? Oh, God is not coming through for me. Since when is this about you? You're angry with God because of your sinful heart. God owes you nothing. Repent. Humble yourself before God. He's, given, he's brought you this far. He's given you life. If you've heard of Christ, now you have opened before you the opportunity of heaven. God owes you nothing. If you're angry with God, that's because of your heart. It's an issue in your heart. God has done this, this, and that to me. I don't contest that. I don't contest that he has done that. Yet, what do we deserve? What do we deserve? Yeah. See, th this brings, I know this is not popular. I know, I know this is not popular, okay? Because the message that is popular is that you deserve better, right? The message that is popular is that God owes you, and you deserve better. But folks, the Bible says that we deserve death. That's what my Bible says. It doesn't say anything about us deserving anything. That God is such a merciful God, that He graces us with so many abundant gifts? Absolutely. Yes. If anything, we should be praising the mercy and the grace of God every day. But to get angry at God because of something that He has taken away from us, and I know that sometimes He takes very important things from our lives, such as the life of a loved one. I know that. And I want to minimize that. But the Bible says God gives and God takes away. And it says more. It says, He who made the wound will bind it. Who is that? 
God. So, we must be quick to know that there may be times that we need to let God or other people off the hook. They're not at fault. They're not at fault. They're not liable before justice. Forgiving says, forgiving says, a forgiving heart, a graceful heart says, I may be at fault. I may be the one that needs forgiveness. Has it ever occurred to you that it may be us? And oftentimes, I want to say more before I say something else. Yes, indeed, as we go through life, we're offended and we're hurt and we're abused. And that is so wrong. For a child to be abused growing up, there's no justification for that. The offenders of, of children and, and their parents and mistreaters and their family members. And, and we live in a world in which we're exposed to so much harm growing up. And that is plain wrong. Ah, oh, but I've seen an evil under the world. That those that are abused grow up and become abusers. Abusers. So if you're a grown up, an adult, and you've been abused... You be very careful with your anger because you may become the abuser. You may be as a result of the offense given you and the wrong and the hurt given you, which was wrong. You be very careful because as a mature grown man, in our sinfulness, we have a tendency to abuse others and to lash out because I've been abused and become an abuser myself. That's why the Bible says, do not be overcome by evil. What happens to somebody who's overcome by evil? You become evil yourself. You give back what you've received. When evil overcomes you, you have nothing to give back but evil. So be very careful when you're angry. Discern whether you also have a responsibility, whether you may be at fault, whether it is a perceived offense. Now, let me tell you this. Let me be quick to add. Forgiving does not negate that a wrong has been committed with all the hurt that accompanies it. One of the things I've seen often with people as I counsel people that are hurting is that they cannot move past their hurt because they have no one to forgive. It is forgiveness that they need. It is forgiving that they need, but they have no one to forgive. Their offenders have vanished. What do you mean, Pastor? They're there. Their offenders are very much in front of them. They know who they are, but they cannot bring themselves to acknowledge that that person has done them wrong. I knew a man that, a man that's very close to me, that was done very wrong by his parents when he was a child. His parents abused him, abandoned him. He grew up and he was messed up. He was functional and he did life, but in a very dysfunctional way, angry inside and display that anger and hurt people around him. And one time as he, as I get insight into the fact that this had been done to him, I say, oh, I see where this anger is coming from. And I try to take him there for him to, to forgive those that forgave them, I see that he has nothing but great admiration for his parents. Great admiration for those that, that hurt him badly. Do not go there because those are my idols. They hurt you. They did you wrong. They did you bad. And, and your inability to understand and come to terms with the fact that I wasn't loved right, I should have been loved right, but I wasn't loved right by my folks, they did me wrong. And if I come to acknowledge that, I succumb. It's like sinking sin. They should have loved me. It's the very parents that should have done me right. So I cannot come to realization of that fact. I can come face to face with the fact that they didn't love me right. I carry it inside, and it's hurting me deeply. It's doing me great harm inside, because deep down, I know that they did me right, but I cannot face the fact. 
I cannot face it, so I live in denial. You know how many people cannot move past their bitterness and hurts because that's the, that's the place where they find themselves. They have somebody in this pedestal, and they cannot acknowledge that they did wrong. They're conflicted within, within themselves. They're conflicted. Forgiveness does not negate that a wrong has been committed with all the hurt that accompanies, that accompanies it. Unless we acknowledge the offense, the injustice, and the hurt caused, we shall never be set free. We shall never move on to truly forgive others and let go of the offense received. Why is that? Because folks, when we forgive, we let go of real offenses. You see that? When we forgive, we let go of real hurts. When we forgive, we free real people from obligations to me. You see? But if we cannot acknowledge that a wrong has been committed, if, we, if I cannot acknowledge what the hurt has come from, I can forgive. There's nothing to forgive. There's no one to free. So i got to carry that inside and turn around and keep displacing my anger and my wrath onto other places. Because I can come and say, it was Daddy that did this to me. And it was very wrong. Very wrong. It hurts deeply. It's hurt all these years. And it was a wrong given me. It was an injustice. He shouldn't have done that. As a father, he should have protected me. He should have cared for me. He did not do it. Folks, it's about being real. There is no living in denial in Christianity. They didn't do me right. It's important to acknowledge that. No, Pastor, I don't need to go to the past. Well, you may not need to go to the past, but the past is with you. The past is with you. You don't want to go there, that's fine, but it is with you. And it may be the reason that God wants you to revisit it is because you need to forgive somebody. See, the reason we are calling you out to acknowledge this is because... You need to forgive. And you will not be able to forgive until, until you grieve that. In forgiving, we let go of real offenses, harm, and the pain inflicted upon us. Oh, you want to set free. You got to acknowledge your offender and that he has done you wrong. Don't ever bypass that, folks. Don't ever bypass it. Forgiving last today, lastly, forgiving begins with the vulnerable attitude of grieving the offense and the hurt. What does that mean? What does that mean? You have two options. Two options when you're hurt, right? On the one hand, you receive the hurt, you get angry, and now you say, how do we feel when we, when we are hurt? It deeply affects us, right? And I don't know about you, but oftentimes I feel like crying. Do you? But men do not cry. Well, maybe crying a little bit is what you need. I don't know what you do, but when I get hurt, oftentimes... I feel pain, and I want to cry, as if I was just a little baby, <laughs> right? But, see, that is just too vulnerable and too painful, and we don't want to do that. Rather than doing that, what we often do is we take that anger and we want to pretend that we're big boys. And we want to play Mr. Rough. 
And we want to say, no, I ain't weak. I'm not vulnerable. I'm not, I'm not a little crybaby. I'm not, I'm, you're not hurting me. I'm going to hurt you back. You're going to see where real strength is. And rather than becoming vulnerable and grieving, what do you do when somebody hurts you? Folks, the very natural thing to do is to grieve. This may sound, I mean, you as a pastor, you're discovering rocket science. Well, I, <laughs> I hope you, you see how important this is. If you see these steps in your life, you can compare it to the unhealthy steps that are happening in your life. Because if rather than punching that wall, I just simply cry and say, you've hurt me deeply. What you've done is very hurtful. If I, don't, if I can say to the person, I always have somebody to go to. And he delights in comforting those that mourn. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What do I do with the anger? Grieve it with God. If you can do anything else, grieve it with God, and grieve it you must. Rather than letting it come out and be destructive, grieve that anger with God. Be honest and humble before God and before the person that has hurt you, and before you immediately hurt that person back, which is what usually happens, you get into a match to see who's going to hurt each other more badly. Oh, you want to deal me that? I'm going to deal you this better. I'm going to go you one better. You don't have to do that. All you can do is grieve and say, I'm hurt. Pastor, but that, that, what if that person now takes over? Don't worry, you serve a mighty God. He defends the weak. He comforts the weak. He comforts those in need. He's a father to the fatherless. He's a father to the widows. He is a God for the weak. Now, if you want to be strong, He ain't for you. Because only one is strong, and that is God. But if you allow yourself to understand that we're offended, that we're hurt, and we can grieve that before God, I can guarantee you that comfort from God will come your way. That comfort from the Lord will come your way. And for those that think they're being tough because they... Let their anger come out in destructive ways. I want to say that you are the weakest among us. That doesn't make you stronger. The strong person is the one that does not deny reality. The strong person is the one that can come face to face with God and with his circumstances and do right. And do right. We're going to come back next Sunday. And finish up this part. I told you it was going to be very practical. Um, in a certain way, you don't hear me preach like this often. Um, in a certain way, this deals with the soul. The knowledge of our soul. What is that? Psychology, right? <laughs> there is a Christian psychology. You've got to be careful with some psychologists out there. Okay, but, but the knowledge of the soul is where? It's here in this Word. And there is a way of knowing the soul and dealing with issues of the soul, and we need healing. And we're brokenhearted, and we're in need of the healing that comes to the soul, that comes face to face before God and says, Oh, Father, I'm broken. Heal me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful this morning that we can delve into uh, some deep corners in our, in our souls. And I pray that by the power of your spirit and your grace, Father, by your word that is powerful and a double-edged sword, that in the same way that you have probably touched some, not me, you, Lord, have touched some buttons here this morning, Lord. Maybe somebody's gotten offended this morning. Father, I pray that with the other side of that sword, your truth, your grace, your love, you will bring, oh Father, correction. You will bring humility. You will bring healing, insight. And Father, the power to be changed 
and the power to walk in healing from your spirit. Lord, we know that we will never be perfectly healed on this side of eternity. But we want to move in that direction. We want to walk in that direction, Lord. Help us be honest before you and before others that we may walk in this path and help us forgive and help us do right in our anger. Help us do better. Help us, Father, experience the joy of obedience and of doing right, the blessedness of the man that does right. Thank you, Lord, for helping us try again. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you, folks. See you Wednesday at 6 o'clock.